Catechism classes. <clears throat> Our scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 1. And also we'll be looking at Lord's Day 2 in the Heidelberg Catechism found on page 202 in the Forms and Prayers. So Romans chapter 1 and Lord's Day 2. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, the word of the Lord. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they knew God righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. May God bless the reading of his word. And then Lord's Day 2, found on page 202 in the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 2, question 3. How do you come to know your misery? The law of God tells me. Question four, what does God's law require of us? Christ teaches us this in summary in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Question five, can you live up to all this perfectly? Answer, no. I'm inclined by nature to hate God and my neighbor. So we come now to Lord's Day 2. Last week, we looked at the first two questions of the catechism. We saw that God provides us with comfort because we belong to Christ. No matter what happens to us, we can have comfort in life and in death. We're safe in Christ. And then we saw in question 2, Three things we need to know to live and die in the joy of this comfort. How great my sin and misery are, how I'm delivered from all my sins and misery, and how I am to thank God for such deliverance. So the catechism then moves in question three to the first of those three things, how great my sin and misery are. So that we begin the guilt section of the catechism, which begins in question three, runs through question 11. This is the law. Now, in Reformed theology, of course, we distinguish between law and gospel. This has been our tradition for centuries as Reformed Christians to distinguish between law and gospel. But for some reason in the last 20 or 30 years or so, some within the Reformed community have said that making a distinction between law and gospel is not reformed, but it's Lutheran. Only Lutherans make a priority of distinguishing law and gospel. Uh, 
If that's true, then we're all Lutherans, all the way back to Calvin. If distinguishing between law and gospel makes you Lutheran, then we'll just be Lutheran. <laughs> but that's been our tradition for centuries. It's not exclusively the doctrine of the Lutherans. Reformed Christians have believed this since the very beginning, including William Perkins, known as the father of Puritanism. It doesn't really get more Reformed than that. He said the law and the gospel are two parts of the word of God and are diverse or different kinds of doctrine. By the law, I understand that part of God's word which promises life to the obeyer. By the gospel, I understand that part which promises it to the believer. So the law, says Perkins, promises life to the obeyer. Do this, obey, and live. Do this, and you will have life. This is the command to Adam in the garden. The implication of God's command to him is that if he obeyed, he would live. Obey and live. And then failure to obey is clear. God says, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or you will surely die. Do this and live. Don't do this and you will die. So it prom the law promises life to the obeyer, and it promises death to the disobeyer. The gospel, says Perkins, promises life to the believer. So the gospel then says, because you have failed to obey, you failed to earn eternal life, Christ has obeyed on your behalf. He's paid the penalty in your place, and so now you receive that promise by believing. It's by faith. So life is granted to the believer, to the believer in Christ. Promise to the believer. So again, the law, do this and live. The gospel, Christ has done it for you. And at its foundation, the law and the gospel, the distinction, is just a way of reading Scripture. Generally speaking, when you see a passage in Scripture that contains commands, it's law. For example, Ephesians 5.1, Therefore, be imitators of God. Pretty clear. This is a command. Do this. Be imitators of God. That's the law. When we see passages that contain a promise, it's the gospel, Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. That's the gospel. Here is what Christ has done for you. And most of the time it really is that simple. A command or a promise. Do this or here is what Christ has done for you for you. Sometimes we actually get the law and the gospel in the same verse. Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So walk in love as Christ did, clearly a command. That's the law. But the verse continues, as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. There you get the gospel. In one verse, a minimum use of words, we get the beauty of the law and the gospel. Sadly today, though, there is great confusion about the law and the gospel, not only in broader evangelicalism, but even in reform circles. When I first went to seminary, unfortunately, I uh, was not wise. I did not go straight to Westminster, California. I went to the master's seminary for a year and a half. And one of the professors there told us that Christ's words to the rich young ruler were not the law. They were, in fact, the gospel. You know the story, Matthew 19. He comes to Christ, teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? He said to him, why do you ask me what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now the professor told us 
that sell all that you have to give all that you have, to sell all that you have, and then give the money to the poor and follow me. He said that was the gospel. There's no gospel in that. That's as clear as the law can be. Sell all that you have, give it to the poor, follow me. That is straight law. No gospel. And that's the point. Christ's whole point is to crush him with the law. He says, all this I have done. All these commandments I have kept. And Jesus says, all right, you think you've kept all these? How about this one? Sell everything you have, give it to the poor. He's crushing him with the law. This is not the gospel. There's much confusion about the law and the gospel, even in Reformed churches. I've been in Reformed churches and have heard sermons that contain very little gospel. One sermon, uh, well, I was in a church in a town in the Midwest with uh, the initials GR, and uh, the sermon was very long, about 60 minutes, and about 55 to 57 minutes of the sermon were law. Just law, law, law. Crushing. You feel like a human punching bag, just over and over, crushed with the law. So some churches overemphasize God's law. They border on legalism. Other churches border on antinomianism with no law. Now, compared to the legalistic churches, there are very few antinomian churches, but they're out there. Gerhard Forty was a Lutheran theologian. He believed that the law only technically refers to the experience of dread proceeding from non-compliance with God's will. The law can only function as a positive demand on the human person when he is out of compliance with it. For the law to ask a righteous person to do something would rather be like asking an oak tree to produce acorns. If we're sanctified by faith, then all is fulfilled and the law is therefore ended. This is, 40 was bordering on antinomianism. Another Reformed seminary professor taught that telling Christians to be holy in their conduct as Christians, this is after you've been converted, he said that was foolish because it's impossible. He says, we can't overcome sin any more than frogs can fly. Now that's true of the unbeliever, but that is definitely not true of the believer with the Holy Spirit. So if you have all gospel and no law, you end up with licentiousness if you have all law and no gospel, you end up with legalism or despair. These are the options. Some who get a steady diet of only law, they recognize there's no way that they can live up to God's perfect standard, and so they lose hope. Maybe they even lack assurance of salvation. Others with a steady diet of only law end up like Pharisees. They think, I'm not so bad. I'm not perfect. But I live a godly life, and at least I'm not like those people. And so we need a proper dose of law and gospel. We need the first use of the law. The first use is what drives us to Christ, exposing the greatness of our sin, driving us to Christ for salvation. And then we need the third use of the law, which shows us as Christians now, now that we've been saved, now that we have come to Christ, it shows us how to live in response to the gospel. And we need it every Lord's Day. The gospel is not just for unbelievers. The gospel is for Christians as well. And so we need to hear it every week. We need the gospel every Lord's Day because our memories are short. We forget. We forget God's promises to us. So we need to hear it every week. We need to see it every week in the sacrament. Taste it. Touch it. Smell it. We need the gospel with a regular diet, a regular diet of the gospel. Because it's the gospel that empowers us to obey the law. You could try to obey the law on, under your own power for a little while. You know, white knuckle it. I'm really going to double down now and be good. That only gets you so far, though. We see people this time of year, of course, everybody's got a New Year's resolution. Most people, by the middle of January, the resolution isn't so prominent after just a few weeks. You can't do it. You have no power of your own. We need the gospel to empower us. 
The Holy Spirit takes the gospel. He empowers us with it. He motivates us by the gospel to obey the law. So without the gospel, it is impossible to be obedient to God's law. And so the catechism then begins with the first use of the law. This is the guilt section. This is the law that drives us to Christ, exposing our sin. Then after this first section of the catechism, we get the gospel, the grace section. And then the catechism closes with the third use of the law, the gratitude section. So we begin with question three. How do you come to know your misery? The law of God tells me. The law reveals our misery. So the law reveals our guilt. This is included in the misery. The misery includes our guilt that we're condemned in Adam. Adam's guilt has been imputed to our account. And as a result of that guilt, we are born corrupt. We're totally depraved. Every part of us is corrupted by sin. And then also we have the punishment for that guilt. So misery is the guilt of sin, but also the punishment for the guilt. The penalty, of course, is that we are punished. We're penalized for our guilt in Adam. We're penalized for our own sinful nature. We're also penalized for the sins that we have committed. And the penalty is eternal condemnation. So the law tells us the greatness of our sin and misery. The next two questions then show us how the law confronts us with our misery. In question four, what does God's law require of us? Quoting Jesus from Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the substance of the law. This, of course, is based on Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is what God's law requires of us. Perfect love. If you don't obey this commandment perfectly, you are cursed. There's no middle ground. God doesn't grade on a curve with the law. A perfect standard of perfection or condemnation. That's it. You know, I just taught this class at the seminary last semester. Last week, I graded 30-some-odd essay exams. Uh, It was rough. (laughs) If there is a purgatory, that might be it. But in this class, I grade on a curve. There is no perfect standard in the exam. I compare the students to each other. So you find the best exam, and then you compare all the other exams to that best exam. God doesn't deal that way. He doesn't compare us to the best human. He compares us to his perfect standard. So what does it mean to love God? We acknowledge him. Acknowledge him in all of his attributes, eternal, infinite, immutable, all-knowing, all-powerful, wise, just, holy, good, true. All of these things, we acknowledge him as perfect, utter perfection. He's the focus of of all of our thoughts, all of our desires, all of our ambitions. We seek God's glory above all else. We love him. He alone is God. There is no other. And so to love him is to reject all rivals. He is the one true God. All others are false gods. And we love him with all our heart, all of our affections, all of our desires, loving him above all else above our family, above our friends, above ourselves. In recent years, self-love has become kind of a trendy thing in our culture. You have to love yourself before you can love anyone else. You hear this? Well, where are we commanded to love ourselves? That's not a problem for us sinners. The problem is we love ourselves too much. And it's a false dichotomy to say, well, if you don't love yourself, well, then you must hate yourself. No, there is a middle ground there. If you hate yourself, ironically, you're still making yourself the focus. You're not making yourself the focus of your love. You're making yourself the focus of your hate. Either way, you're looking at you. You're the center of your existence, consumed with yourself. 
Rather, set the self aside. Don't hate yourself, but don't, consume, don't be consumed with love for yourself either. Love of yourself before all others. We set it aside. We lay it down as Christ laid down his life for his people. So he, we love him with all our heart. We love him with all our souls. Ursinus, the author of the catechism, said that this references the will. So our hearts, our affections, our desires, and then our souls, our will, our will and purpose, all are perfectly aligned to God. Not aligned toward our own wants and desires, but our will is perfectly aligned to him. And we love him with all of our mind, our understanding, our thinking. Our minds are perfectly devoted to him, thinking God's thoughts after him. And we love him with all our strength. This is our actions. All that we do is for the glory of God. All of our energies are directed toward him. And Jesus calls this the greatest and the first commandment. It's the greatest, first of all, because the object is the greatest. God is the object of this commandment. So, of course, it is the greatest commandment with him as the object, but it's also the greatest because everything else flows out of this. So if we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then we will obey all the other aspects of the law. If we get this right, everything else will fall into place. And the second, then, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So if we love God perfectly, we will have the desire to love our neighbor. The love of neighbor is a manifestation of the love of God. You can't really love your neighbor if you don't love God. And it's the second commandment because it's a summary of the second table of the law. Commandments 5 through 10 primarily are directed toward our neighbor. They're more horizontal than vertical, the first four commandments, directed toward God. So it's a second commandment directed toward our neighbor. So we take our eyes off of ourselves, we direct them toward God, the first and greatest commandment, and then God directs our eyes towards our neighbor, the second commandment. Of course, the standard for the second commandment is the same as the first, perfection, requiring the setting aside of ourselves putting our neighbors before us. It's difficult, though, because we are the most self-centered culture in the history of the world. And we are because we can afford to be. We have that luxury. In the past, you had to rely on your neighbor to survive. If you're hostile to your neighbor, you might not have food. If you get to a spat in the medieval period with your local dairy farmer, you're not getting any milk. Or if you're in an argument with the local blacksmith, where are you going to get tools to farm? You need your neighbor to survive. Everything was connected personally. Today, we just buy everything. We don't have to have that personal connection. You go to the store anonymously, or even more anonymously, you go to Amazon, buy a product, do you have any idea how it was produced, who made it, where it comes from, how it was made? It's entirely self-absorbed. I want this, so I buy it. Do you think about the food you buy at the store? Where did this ground beef come from? Who raised this cow? Who took it to market? How was it butchered? I never think of that. I just buy it. We have that luxury, the most wealthy society in the history of the world. We don't have to think about those things. What about your phone? Who built that? How much was that person paid to build that? We don't know. We're not forced to think about it. But here's where it gets sticky. Is that loving your neighbor? Should we take the time to find out where all this stuff comes from that we buy? Should we take the time to ensure that we aren't buying products for companies that exploit people? If your answer is yes, that we should take the time, well, if you want to do research, you're going to have to build your own computer. 
Almost all of our electronic technology contains elements that are produced by what is essentially slave labor. Whether it's the iPhone that's assembled in China by people who are basically wage slaves, or the cobalt mines in the Congo where they use child labor to mine the elements that go into lithium ion batteries, almost everything that we produce, that we buy, is produced by oppression. So is buying these products loving our neighbor? If we can't confidently say yes, then we know we haven't fulfilled the second greatest commandment. So obeying the law of God is not always simple. We need to wrestle with these things. There's no easy answer. How do we live in this world and love our neighbor? Jesus says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All the law of God can be found in these two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. So in the Mosaic law, we divide it between the civil, the ceremonial, and the moral law. So the law of Moses has three components, the civil, the ceremonial, the moral. The civil law covers the laws for life in Israel. So if your ox gores your neighbor's ox, you make restitution. That's the civil law. The ceremonial law then covers Old Testament worship. All the sacrifices, all the offerings, the feast days, this is the ceremonial law. And then the moral law is the natural law. This is the law of God that's written on our hearts. This law predates the Mosaic law. So the civil and ceremonial, we see them first in the Mosaic law, but the moral law predates the Mosaic law. This is what Adam had in the garden. He had the moral law. And then in the New Testament, when we see the law of Christ, it refers to the moral law. So the moral law predates the law of Moses, and it postdates the law of Moses. Galatians 6, verse 2, bear one, another burden, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So the moral law is summarized in the Ten Commandments and in love God and love your neighbor. And so you'll often hear Christians say, we're not under law, we're under grace. And that means we're not under the civil and the ceremonial law anymore, that has been abrogated, that has been done away with, but we still are under the moral law. We don't get out from under that in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. We still are obligated to obey God's moral law, even as Christians. So how are you doing with this? Loving God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your soul, your neighbor as yourself? Feeling good about it? Question five, can you live up to all this perfectly? No, I'm inclined by nature to hate God and my neighbor. Natural man cannot obey the law of God. He hates God and his neighbor. And we see that in Romans chapter one, verse 30, when Paul is listing these heinous acts of sin and included among those is haters of God. By our nature, we're inclined to hate God and our neighbor. Now, most people in the world believe that people are generally good. Yeah, people are generally good. We're born innocent. We make mistakes. There are some really bad people out there, but most people are generally good. God's word said, says otherwise. No one is good. Not only are we not good, we hate God. We hate God and we hate each other. And there's no way out of this by our own strength. We are unable to overcome our nature to hate God and our neighbor. Unable to overcome this through our own efforts. But yet, God loves us even when we hate him. He doesn't love us because we're lovely. We're not lovable. He makes us lovely by extending his love to us. And by his grace, he changes that nature, that nature 
that is inclined to hate God and our neighbor, now he inclines our nature to love God and to love our neighbor, giving us a new nature in Christ. So we should not confuse law and gospel. We don't want to diminish one, overemphasize the other. We want to have a perfect diet of law and gospel. Seeing law is good. The law reveals the greatness of our sin and misery. It drives us to Christ. And then, by faith, we embrace Christ, who delivers us from all our sin and misery through the work of the gospel. Let's bow together in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing your law to us in your word and also in general revelation and creation in our own hearts. You've written the law on our hearts. And Father, when we see your perfect law revealed in Scripture, we are confronted with the greatness of our sin and misery, how much we fall short of your perfect standard. We are hopeless in and of ourselves. But we are so grateful, Father, that you use your law to, draw, to drive us to your Son, who rescues us from our condition of sin and misery, provides us grace, fulfilling the law on our behalf, clothing us in his righteousness. And so now we can stand before you clean, clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. We thank you for the Lord's Day the blessing of the word and the sacrament. Be with us now as we go forth throughout the week, as we fulfill our various vocations in life. We pray that we would honor you in all that we say and do. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen.